So we have had the opportunity to have an overview of trauma and some of its consequences, looking at community, uh, police systems, and the courts. Just had a panel on trauma-informed schools. The next discussion will be on community strategies. And I have the distinct pleasure and honor to uh, chair this panel. You have the bio sketches of two of the three people in your folder, but one was inadvertently omitted. And I want to tell you a bit about him for many reasons. Tony Eiten uh, graduated from McGill University, came here to Hopkins, got his MD degree, went to California and Berkeley, where he got his MPH and PhD degrees. But all of those degrees are not the most distinguishing characteristics about his work and his contribution. He's the senior vice president of healthy communities at the California Endowment, which is a terrific title, but far more terrific is the work that he has been spearheading in communities across California. Dr. Wrighton came uh, and uh, spoke uh, at our symposium two years ago. And following that, he returned a year later and did a series of meetings and consultations with uh, the uh, number of groups in our community. And he spoke about some of the community initiatives that uh, were being spearheaded in California. And after his visit, I asked him, where do you think some of the absolutely most exciting work is being done? He said, you've got to see San Diego. And I was going to a meeting in San Diego last June, and uh, he connected me with Godwin Higa. And uh, it, in some ways, has come full cycle uh, today uh, to have Godwin here as well as you, Tony. So thank you all uh, for participating in this panel. Steve Berkowitz has done extraordinary work in Pennsylvania uh, and in Philadelphia, and uh, Ivan Jusik is the uh, founder and uh, CEO of Me Productions, is someone who I have had the opportunity to know for an extended period of time, uh, we serve on a board together. Steve, let me turn it to you, and welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, when I was asked to, to participate and do a presentation, I was really pleasantly surprised, wasn't sure that they really wanted me uh, Stevie Berkowitz from Northwest Baltimore. Um, and then I uh, actually I looked at the program last night and I saw that it was another Steve Berkowitz's picture and they really didn't want me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then I confirmed that that was a mistake and they didn't want me after all. So, <clears throat> so it is really a pleasure to be here, and I am a Baltimorean at heart. Um, I still root for the Orioles and uh, still mourn the Colts um, and hate them dearly. So, uh, <laughs> and when I moved to Philadelphia uh, almost six years ago, one of the joys was being closer. Um, and uh, I hope I'm back and, and working with you all uh, as time goes on over the next couple of years. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, really a transformation in the behavioral health system in Philadelphia. Uh, now, we could call it trauma-informed behavioral health, but I want to say that it really is people-informed behavioral health. And we've heard how everybody understands trauma-informed really as being, tell me about what your story is. Tell me who you are. And I think that's the key part of it. 
whether we mean trauma as an injury or we mean it as we all have stories. Um, that's really what I think is key to understanding is that everybody has a story to tell and we need to listen. And one of the dilemmas, of course, is that we might ask our schools, our providers, our agencies to change their behavior, but if the system's behavior is the same, it doesn't go anywhere, does it? And that's an ongoing dilemma in our bureaucratic systems. So I'm going to tell you the story about how things changed in Philadelphia. So first, you know Philadelphia's about an hour and a half up the road, right? It's one and a half, a little over one and a half million people. It's the fifth largest city in the United States. But here's some of the things that the city of Broadway Love has to offer. Um, it is a poor city. Its unemployment rate is incredibly high. And maybe what says it all is that 80% of the children in Philadelphia are either on Medicaid or uninsured. 80%. That's mind-boggling to me. And it has the second poorest congressional district in the United States. Not Mississippi, not Alabama, Philadelphia. So it's a lot like Baltimore in many, many ways. There are a lot of similarities. Uh, demographically, there are a lot of similarities in all sorts of ways. I think the big difference is it's about two and a half times the size. Um, and it's also challenged geographically, by the way, which I think makes a difference. Um, if you try to get from the north end of Philadelphia, the northeast end of Philadelphia, to the southeast end of Philadelphia, it could take you two and a half, three hours on traffic. So that that's, makes a difference when you think about trying to do these things. I think when we talk about focusing on traumatic situations, ongoing stress, maltreatment, the first thing that you have to do is do that, this kind of assessment. Is it a fit? Is it a match for what you're trying to do? Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. For Philadelphia, and I would argue for Baltimore, it is a match. Importantly, you also can't ask for somebody's story or a system story or a city story without saying what works, what's good, what are your strengths. And that's also part of the assessment that was done. And one of the things that Philadelphia has, much like Baltimore, is it has some really amazing people doing some amazing work at all different levels. And I can't help but mention one of the key people is Sandy Bloom, who you've heard about many times today, uh, the founder of the Sanctuary Model and a constant companion in working with the city in trying to transform and change things. So those are strengths that you have to call on, and there are many here as well. Now, the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services um, is incredibly large relative to many of the other pro, um, agencies or, or systems like it. Um, and one of the key differences is that uh, when uh, the Medicaid carve-outs started about 20-something years ago, the city decided that it was going to take over and be the carve-out, a single-payer carve-out, under the auspices of DBH IDS. So community behavioral health, which is a quasi-governmental agency, I think maybe out of the post office if you want to think of it that way, is under the directorship of the commissioner. And that, I think, lays groundwork for being able to do things that can't be done necessarily as easily in other systems because both the policy and the operations are under one roof. And I think that really makes a profound difference. I should say, um, when I, I was at Yale and, and Connecticut for about 20 years, and one of the things I used to complain about, now miss dramatically, is um, a single child agency, where juvenile justice, child protective services, and child behavioral health were under one roof. Uh, and I think you have, can do things, you can think about things somewhat differently when there's that integration. <clears throat> So 
I kind of came to systems change uh, in a circuitous route. Uh, and I just want to be very honest about that. I'm not, don't have a degree in public health. Um, I play one on TV. Um, but I came to it in a sort of organically uh, in New Haven, really starting to work with law enforcement very, very closely. Um, in fact, we replicated our program here in Baltimore many years ago in East Baltimore, the Child Development Community Policing Project, uh, where we worked with officers and trained them in child development and trauma, and they would train us in police protocol, and we would go to crime scenes, work with the kids and families together. And one of the things I recognized over the years in replicating the program and working with other police departments uh, was that systems change required two things. It required leadership, somebody who had a vision, and it required buy-in from the rank and file. Now, that's easier said than done. And, you know, one of the things I was talking about is how we come up here often and we talk about how we did these things and you sit there in the audience and you go, wow, how did they do that? It seems so easy. It's not so easy. And it's a lot of warts and it's a lot of bumps and it takes 20 some odd years to make these kind of changes. We're in process here and we always will be in process. But the key piece is to institutionalize it. Because in our political systems, one of the things that happens is you can have a great leader, the next mayor comes along and they're gone. And everything starts over again, or it can, unless it gets institutionalized by the rank and file who are going to eventually become mill managers and some part of the leadership. And I think that that's a crucial aspect. This is uh, practice guidelines for uh, basically agencies in Philadelphia and for the Department of Behavioral Health. And this started in 2006 with a convening of a number of stakeholders in the community, um, leaders in the field, uh, so on and so forth, uh, regarding what needs to change in behavioral health. And this really grew out of the complete and utter frustration of what I would say was just ineffective, old style thinking about what you do in behavioral health. You know, you treat the chronically, pervasively mentally ill, you treat the kids because you have to, and that's what we do. Okay. It does sound familiar, doesn't it? Uh, so this, there, is a, there are an inordinate number of uh, recommendations made, the Blue Ribbon Commission, there, you know, there's a, I don't know how long the, the recommendations are, and the, probably 200 pages, most of which there is no money to do. They're really great ideas, but, you know, we've all had that, you know, great idea, how are you going to fund it? This grew out of really working in the trenches and talking to people. And so this is a really practice guidelines about people first, person first, tell me your story, ways of thinking about behavioral health. Not the tip of the iceberg, which I do a lot of, treating the worst, most traumatized children and families in the city. But how do you do it in a public health model, thinking about the community as individuals, the community with others, uh, organizations and agencies, how do you work together, how do you grow and hopefully heal together in a different way, in a different way of thinking, and identifying those people who need the high-end services, but trying to decrease the number who need those high-end services at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so, one of the key aspects of uh, this model is uh, the department supports and pays agencies to hire peer specialists uh, to help integrate into the community, provide information about behavioral health and trauma and trauma-informed programming, and usually, and really trying to partner with the community in, in that way. And that was a, it's a really, there are many studies, many places that do that sort of thing, but as a department, that was really different and sophisticated. In addition, the department paid for training in the sanctuary model for about 25 major, largest agencies in the city, uh, where they, in, including the agency I'm at, uh, that's part of the University of Pennsylvania, where 
you know, the sanctuary model is part and parcel of the process of the organization and of our approach to our clients as well as each other. And then I think maybe most importantly was that the goals that of, of the department in terms of what to do in the community, what to do in the agencies, were also the same goals as what to do in the department. So Commissioner Evans, and I will, you know, full disclosure, um, I mentioned to the group I was meeting with this morning, uh, my firm belief that uh, human beings really respond mostly to crisis. We're not very good at preparing. Uh, we try, but really, who wants to prepare for things we hope never happen? We need to make opportunity out of the crisis. We need to learn from the crisis and make opportunity. That's a window that we have. And um, Dr. Evans uh, was the Deputy Commissioner of Behavioral Health in Connecticut uh, when the attacks on 9-11 occurred. Um, and I became the Director of Child Trauma Services for the State of Connecticut, uh, Yale, and UConn. And so we, um, we got to know each other pretty well. And he learned a lot about trauma. Uh, he was a substance abuse uh, clinician and, and director, and he learned a lot about trauma from 9-11. He, you know, that was a big single incident trauma that, that Jim mentioned earlier today, but then you start to peel away the onion and you find many, many more things, right? And we know, for instance, that in these situations, the kids and families that do the worst had histories of trauma and stress after these events. Um, and in fact, if you look at the literature, poverty trumped everything after 9-11 in New York and Southern Connecticut. So that was an opportunity. And when uh, Penn was recruiting, my wife and I, uh, Dr. Evans, decided that he was going to throw his hat into the ring and make sure that I got down there um, to work on, on what he was trying to do. So I mentioned leadership. You need a champion. These are big changes. These are huge systems. Um, I'm not even sure that aircraft carriers are appropriate analogy. Um, and Arthur uh, did something I think that was really, really important. He met with everybody that worked at the department and asked them to tell him their story. Um, it was the, you know, show me, don't tell me model of transformation and transparency. And if you start there, if you don't, if you don't change the way you do your work, we all get caught up on the hamster wheel all the time. But if you don't change that, you don't form those relationships in a real significant way, then how can you ask anybody else to do it? How can you ask the gray school down the street? You do it based on, you know, great people who come in and have great ideas, but that's, you know, that's one school at a time, which is okay, but you have to set the, the, the ground. You have to fertilize the fields in order for that to happen. And the only way to do that is to be honest and transparent with one another, and that's what he did. And I think um, my hats are off to him, and that was the buy-in. And then you got the people who are on the phones answering the calls nonstop, the people who are doing the policy in the street, working with the schools, working with others, to buy in because they were no longer anonymous cogs in the wheel. And that's how many of these people felt, right? Anybody ever feel that way? Yeah. The treadmill, right? You're on that treadmill, you're just doing your job, nine to five, eight to eight. Um, but you know, that's how you feel, you know? I'm just one of them. But nobody really asks you how you are involved in this. Who are you? I'm gonna skip this. People have said this so many times. So here's what most of our systems look like, right? This is what they look like. Um, this is what our, our bureaucracies, what our governmental systems look like, you know? The individuals don't feel that they're, they're trusted, they don't feel safe. Right? They don't have, they don't have a sense of, of any really self-regulation, emotional regulation. 
they're overwhelmed by all the work and they're, you know, I can't remember what I did yesterday, let alone, you know, what I did last week. Communication problems, oh my God, right? Um, you know, this little unit's doing that, this little unit's doing that. Lo and behold, they find out they're talking to the same people in the city. Nobody knows, right? Um, there's always those discussions about, oh, the leadership doesn't understand me this way. They don't understand how hard it is. So they don't, you know, they don't really trust their authorities. They don't trust their people. Um, they don't understand why people get moved around. Um, why do some people get promoted? Some people get demoted. Uh, it's always because you know they're friends with somebody, um, you know, and you know you can't, you don't have time to even think about the past or the future. Right. Again, sound familiar? Yeah. Right. So you have to recognize that that the people that you're talking about, you're talking about working with, treating, affecting, supporting, helping. How can you help them if your system feels the same way as they do? It's hard. Ah, the lone voice. <laughs> so who's in the system? People from diverse backgrounds, different experiences. By the way, they're coming from the community that you're working with often. They have some of the same stories of the people that you're worried about, that you want to intervene with. On the same page, are they? Do they speak the same language? I was just in a meeting here last week with primary care and behavioral health providers who are trying to integrate the, in, in pediatrics. And they were using the same words. The language is completely different. It was remarkable. It took me a while to figure out. I was getting very confused, I have to say. But it was amazing. So that's really important. How can you talk to each other if you think you're saying the same thing and you're not even sure what the definition is? Or you don't agree on the definition? And do they have a sane way of thinking about what they're doing? Or is it applied in the same way? You need all these other pieces before you can even do that. Now, that's not possible to say, okay, we're going to stop, do nothing, and you know, we're going to fix ourselves first. You're doing it simultaneously. But the conversation is important. If you don't have these conversations, how can you really transform your system in a way that's really going to impact who you're working with and your families and your kids? So, in a nutshell, what is a trauma-informed system? We've known this for 4,000 years, folks. Right? We've known this for 4,000 years. Can we do it is the question. And I would argue that we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice in Philadelphia, Baltimore, Boston, Atlanta, San Diego, Chicago. We don't have a choice. We have to change the way we do business. And we have to listen to people and ask them what they need and what they want. And it starts with Heal Thyself. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Amy to the rescue. So I used to take classes in this auditorium. And I used to sleep in the back row right about there. <laughs> it's nice lighting. Actually, you can lie down there a little bit, too, if you need to. It's bringing back fond memories. So, uh, wow, that really is loud here. So, hi, I'm Tony Eiten, and um, this has been a pretty amazing conference. Um, real, real eye-opener in terms of the level of understanding, sophistication, research, practice that has been happening in this area of trauma-informed systems, institutions. I want to talk about something a little bit different, um, really about trauma-informed communities. And, and I want to start off by sort of asking you to imagine something. It's, it's a real thing. It's actually my job. Um, and that is that you get hired uh, to this mysterious-sounding enterprise called the Health Foundation. 
and they hand you a white sheet of paper and a bag full of a billion dollars. And they say, your job, should you choose to accept it, is to take this billion dollars and this white sheet of paper and write up a strategy for improving the health status in a measurable way of about a million people in 14 low-income, highly disadvantaged communities throughout the state of California. And just when you're about to say, yeah, <laughs> they say, but there's one caveat. You can't spend a nickel on health care. And I still said, yeah. <laughs> and so this is a little bit of that story. And it actually starts uh, in another country. This is uh, Montreal, Canada. I actually was born in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and then my parents quickly spirited us off to Canada. Um, this is around the time of the Vietnam War. My mother was concerned about what might happen to her three black sons. We were in Canada. I grew up there during a, a wonderful time in Canada's history, in Montreal's history. The, the 1967 Man in His World, the uh, 1976 Olympic Games. It was a city that was thriving, um, very much an international and cosmopolitan city. And I thought, wow, this is a wonderful place to be. Uh, this is a view from uh, Mount Royal overlooking McGill University, where I went to school, and that's downtown Montreal on the St. Lawrence River in the background. And then in 1985, I decided, hey, let's check out another city. So I got into medical school here and came down to Baltimore. And this is what I was confronted with. And I had no way of understanding what this is. I still don't, actually. I really don't. I, this is not a norm for me. This is not something that I would ever expect to find. And the day that I expect to find it is the day I should really get out of this business. So my norms were set early in life. I had an expectation of what a community looked like, of what kind of social investments go into ensuring that as many people as possible are healthy through policy and investments in essentially the development of healthy people. And I asked myself, what would I be like if I was this kid growing up in East Baltimore? And the question that Jonathan Kozel raised it this morning about how much of this is by design? And if it's made, how can we unmake it? So what I want to talk to you a little bit about today in this brief moment is about how do we stop injuring young people in the first place? I mean, a lot of the injury we talk about is happening inside the home, it's domestic violence, it's uh, abuse, and all of that is horrific. But there's also an abuse and violence that happens outside the door that this kid really walks into every day when he leaves his home. And we do have control over that. And that's what we're trying to do with our billion dollars and our white sheet of paper uh, in California, is to try to understand what can we do consciously to reduce the risk and increase resilience in these communities through primarily policy and systems change? So at the community level, we know and we've heard today that this manifests itself in violence, racism, and implicit bias. We've seen the Black Lives Matter and the All Lives Matter efforts throughout the country and this very different set of perspectives about how people see institutions like the police. We certainly know of intergenerational trauma, and we've heard uh, from many of the speakers today about the uh, neurological imp implications of chronic stress and, and toxic stress and trauma. It actually injures the brain. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because there are people here much more expert at that than I. What we do see at the community level, and I spoke about this earlier today with the Baltimore City Health Department, is that you see Children, and this has been my experience in everywhere I've gone. I, when I used to be in medical school here, I was always confused by what I saw in the eyes of people in East Baltimore. 
it seemed to me that people had lost hope. There was this sort of, always this effort when you were talking to somebody in East Baltimore to try to figure out where their gaze was. I always found myself kind of trying to meet their gaze because people would sort of look off and talk to you as if you were sort of like this almost abstract entity. Then I spent some time in Africa and in South Africa, and I, I noticed that that gaze was not there. It wasn't present in people in Soweto during apartheid. And I thought, what is America doing to people to kill their hope? And you see it in young people. You see they have this light in their eyes, and as they age, as Goodwin said earlier, that middle school period is when they start to see that light of hope turn into anger and resentment. And as they get older, it starts to fade. And it's that fading of that light that contributes so much to the adverse health outcomes that kids experience. So our work in trying to work with partners who are working on institutional changes, work with partners who are working on uh, policy and programmatic changes, is to look holistically at communities and try to understand how do we optimize resiliency and minimize risk? We find that even small doses of resiliency can go a long way, particularly early in the life course of young children. Okay, so let me tell you about building healthy communities. As I said, it's a billion dollars, no rules, just don't spend it on healthcare services. 14 low-income communities representing the beautiful rainbow of diversity that is California, from our northernmost counties with the Native American uh, populations and, and reservations down to the very south, from the coastal areas to the um, Central Valley. We recognize that if you're going to do this work, you have to invest in people. That's the greatest resource. And this is the thing that I think strikes me most about kind of the American context, is that we consider wealth really all about personal wealth, and we don't really think about societal wealth. When I showed you those pictures of Canada before, I grew up in a system that invested in me. It was universal health care, universal dental care until the age of 12. I went to McGill University essentially for free. The tuition was $800 back in those days. It's now probably about 7000 There were societal investments that created wealth that was much more evenly distributed. In this country, I don't have to tell you the statistics about access to health care, about paid sick leave, about the cost of child care, about the cost of tuition in college, even at state schools. And what that does, it's an inefficient way to distribute a necessary societal wealth. And so in our efforts, we're trying to figure out what policy levers do we have at our disposal that can actually help make investments at critical periods, particularly amongst uh, young children and families, that will actually further their lives and propel them onto higher trajectories than we would otherwise be able to do by using this inefficient system of distributing resources. The goal of this work is not about helping people beat the odds. It's about changing the odds. The odds, I like to say, are man-made. And they can be unmade. I'm sorry, fellas, but it's most often by the work of women. Women are smarter, and they're much more committed to issues that matter societally. <laughs> it's true. That's always an applause line, by the way. <laughs> so in every society, four systems that we have to be concerned about, um, particularly in the lives of young children and family, the health systems, the human service systems, uh, the educational system, and then sort of the land use and um, physical and social environment uh, system. So our work is really to try to optimize the trauma-informed potential of all of these systems, particularly as they interact in the lives of young children and families. So in the healthcare system, 
Uh, we've worked a lot with Nadine Burke Harris and John Rich, who's in, in Philadelphia, uh, in trying to understand what trauma-informed healthcare practice looks like, which means understanding the impacts of toxic stress on patients, staff, and providers, training your workers and providers in understanding trauma, using screening tools, and many of these are coming along through uh, research and uh, practice, screening tools to identify toxic stress as part of the routine wellness visits, and then using evidence-based multidisciplinary interventions. In the child welfare system, we're trying to maximize the child's sense of safety and help kids reduce overwhelming emotion, help children make new meaning of their trauma history and current experiences, also training and looking at resources like the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. In communities, this is one of the pieces that's often overlooked, we have one of our communities in California is called East Salinas, or Alisal. And in Alisal, at the very same time as Ferguson, there were four police-involved homicides, four of unarmed men, all shot in the process of encountering police. And in Alisal, we had the same risk of community violence and protest in response to this police violence. But because we had relationships, we had invested in this gentleman who's being pictured here is named Jerry Teo, who runs La Cultura Cura, which is a curriculum, a community curriculum that creates healing circles. It anticipates the trauma that young people are exposed to. It anticipates the institutional response to young people that have been exposed to trauma and violence and how those institutions re-traumatize young people. And it intervenes in a way to create community-level healing. It's one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. For those of you who are interested, just Google Jerry Teo. But it's a community-level healing and transformative process to try to actually facilitate the kind of trauma-informed practices at a much broader level. And then finally, we recognize that young people are the rocket fuel that makes advocacy work. And I've spoken about this twice already today in two different settings. There's something about young people who've experienced trauma that those that are very expert in youth organizing, and now there's a spectrum that goes from youth development to youth leadership to youth organizing, and they're all important. But those that are on the youth organizing part of the spectrum, they recognize something different when they see a traumatized young person. A lot of the folks that work in, in youth programs, they see anger. And they tend to actually want to disassociate themselves with angry kids, because angry kids can be disruptive. They'll get into a fight, you know, in the after school program. The organizers see something different. They see an opportunity. They see an opportunity to take that anger, and they use this jujitsu where they flip that anger into something constructive. It turned it into a righteous indignation and allow them through organizing to use that passion for justice to create change. And we've recognized this, that this is something we need to invest in, youth organizing. Kids need a sense that they have some control over what's going to happen to them. Otherwise, that light starts to extinguish. And the ability, particularly around the middle school years, where things start to flip and they start to individuate and differentiate themselves from their parents and start to associate themselves with peers, who they're exposed to at that level and the resources that are around them can make all the difference in the world. But finally, I think, and in, in there's been a lot of talk, you know, in, in preparing these talks, we were joking on the panel that, you know, as you get towards the end of the day, you're cutting slides, because oh, that was said already. This has already been discussed. And, you know, one of the investments I wanted to talk about was trauma-informed schools, but the panel before did a really nice job of it. So I want to take a slightly different tack on it and talk about, from a policy perspective, what are the opportunities that are available to us in the last few minutes here. So you've heard about trauma-informed schools. You've heard some very good examples of the practices that are going on uh, in those schools. In California, we came to this issue because our communities told us this was an issue. There are half a million kids suspended and expelled from schools in California every year, and that's more kids than there are kids that get a diploma. 
And it's overwhelmingly disproportionate, uh, highly male, highly African-American, disproportionately Latino and Native American as well. But the disproportionality is, is as outrageous as could be imagined. So we worked uh, in concert with our partners to change policy in California to make it more difficult for schools to suspend children. We wanted schools to do more to find ways to seek alternative forms of discipline. And as a result, we've been able to drop suspensions and expulsions in California by 25% over the past two years, which is more than any state in the country. So that's just the same data there. We know that a kid that's suspended um, it has a much higher likelihood of dropping out, much higher likelihood of repeating a grade, much higher likelihood of uh, participating in the uh, juvenile justice system. We know that schools with the highest graduation rates have the lowest suspension rates. Schools with the highest uh, suspension rates have the lowest graduation rates as well, so that uh, correlate. And this is the last thing I want to show you because I think it's, it speaks to Goodwin, wherever he went, um, and his perspective on how you construct a school climate. A lot of the resistance that we got initially in the schools around pursuing um, positive behavioral interventions and supports, which is a strategy to try to change the school climate, restorative justice approaches, was that if we can't suspend these kids, we're under all this pressure around common core and testing, California they're called API scores, um, that those kids that are disruptive and are disciplinary problems are gonna actually detract from our test scores. And we found the exact opposite. At those schools that made the greatest investment in choosing the school, uh, changing the school climate saw the greatest increase in their API scores. And that's like counterintuitive to a lot of people in the school system because we've been through this sort of hyperdisciplinary environment. And school after school we've looked at this and we found that same phenomenon. Um, this data is, is, is more of the drop in suspensions and one of the things that I'm most proud of, those schools on the far right in the middle and the far right are the columns in which we're working those 14 communities building healthy community schools have seen the greatest drop in suspensions and expulsions. And this is through a combined community-oriented process of policy change and institutional change. Okay, so in public health, we preach a lot. We talk a lot. We, we're very good at diagnosis. We're not so good at treatment. Um, we have great ideas. We have whole journals full of diagnostic, descriptive problems. But when it comes to figuring out what is the practice that allows us to treat and solve some of these problems, we kind of go silent. And one of the things that we don't talk enough about is that when you are trying to solve a problem, you can solve it downstream where you have injured people, you can solve it midstream, where you have people that are at high risk of being injured, or you can solve it upstream, where you have a population that may be exposed, but hasn't been exposed yet. And the real money, the real savings, is going as far upstream as you can and investing in primary prevention. So my feeling and my appeal really to people that are working in this space is yes, we have to look at the whole spectrum, but let's try to understand and prevent through policy and systems change what it is that is injuring children in the first place. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about not systems as much, um, even though I do wish I had that white piece of paper.
even $10 million, you know what I mean? Um, but what I'm, I'm going to talk about is, is really what we do at the community level. So this is about building trust to promote resiliency that already exists. So I have to go through a few slides to kind of give the context for the main point about what, what I really want to say about how do we build trust in communities. So I'll take you kind of through that, and then I'll get to the, to the main point. I want to start off by saying Me Productions is a – we're an ad agency that focuses on behavior health issues. So folks call us when they're actually trying to persuasively change behaviors of audiences. So we do a lot of direct-to-consumer campaigns, just the way an ad agency would. But one of the things that we've really done over the last 20 years is we've focused a lot on grassroots. And people say, well, as an ad agency, why do you do so much grassroots? It's because we realize that actually going into the community directly um, – puts the skills directly in the community and they stay there, you know, way after the campaign's over. So I'm going to kind of talk about some of our grassroots stuff. Thank you also, yes. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me tell you, as a communicator, what, what we do know is in today's world, and, and the young people we work with have been raised on media, they're digitally connected, and what they say about public health communications is that you're not talking to me. And what we see overwhelming is that we can have messages out there, but the messages aren't talking to the audience in a way that they don't opt out of it, or in some cases they're actually counterproductive and or insulting. So we focus on how to develop messages that reach this audience. And one of the things I want you to understand is that, you know, it's not enough to be able to just develop culturally relevant messages. It's being able to actually have trust with the community to put those messages in there. So trust gets you access. So we'll talk about that. So here's our approach. We, we basically do work around the country, and we always try to get young people to make what we call informed choices. As you'll learn, you can't change someone's behavior. A person changes his or her own behavior, but you have to give them information so that they can make better choices to be able to change it. I always say that particularly when we think about media stereotypes of young black men, I always say they're not making bad choices, they're making uninformed choices. If they've only been taught two, sir, two ways to do something and they've both been bad because they've been modeled in the home and they've been modeled negatively in the media, that's all they can choose from. So how do you give them a broader range of, of choices and options? And that's what I want to talk about even in our mental health work. So as you know, in mental health, you can either respond negatively or cope negatively or you can cope positively. And what we've even seen, particularly in, in the lowest income black communities around the country, is there's a group of young people, same neighborhood, different choice, they're actually thriving. So what are those kids doing in terms of thriving, but in the exact same neighborhood? So we'll talk about that. But the goal is to look at how to get young people to make informed choices. So one of the things that we do is we take the basic model communications and we flip it. And we really try to make sure we understand and start with the audience that we're trying to reach. So one of the things you need to know about the audience that we work with, particularly low-income people of color, is you've got to understand their context, or I call worldview. You have to understand chronic sustained trauma, and I think you've heard that today. I mean, it's not just an episode here or there. It's monthly, it's quarterly, it's what I call sustained trauma that they're experiencing. And then the final thing you have to understand is that their communications culture is oral-based, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So what we find, particularly in our public health work, is that a lot of times we're bringing a literate-based culture and we're trying to apply it in an oral-based community. So we have to look at how we're talking to communities and understanding their communications culture. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So the key thing that we talk about is worldview. And a lot of times I always say, like, you know, being in this auditorium, you may be seeing me from up there, but what I see from here is totally different. And when we're doing communications, we have to understand the worldview of the audience that we're trying to reach. Perception is reality. How they perceive things impacts how, the, how they're going to deal with things. So let me just give you a few. We've developed a model. We call it the eight-variable model or context. And I'll just give you a few of them. So one, we look at economics. And one of the things, like Tony, I travel around the world as well, and poverty in America is, is, is not like poverty anywhere in the world. And people always say, why is that? You know, when I go overseas, people say, well, you know, if you're poor there, at least you're making a lot of money, or you get a lot of money. And I says, no, what you, what you see is that when you travel the world, you see poverty, 
But you don't realize it's poverty, and the audience doesn't realize they're living in poverty because they're going about their normal lives. What you see in America is a different kind of poverty because the media is constantly advertising to poor people. And they're constantly showing them things that they don't need, but what we want to sell them, and they're using hip-hop culture to do it, right? So we, we have to understand that poverty, what I always say in America, poverty makes young people angry because they can't get those things that we're trying to sell them to. Another example is, um, is government. So I just came back from South Africa. I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about government. Finally, we're dealing with this whole police issue. Young people have been talking, as you all know, young people have been talking about this for 20 years. We didn't take them serious 20 years ago when they were saying this. They've been talking about this for a long time. And finally, because we're able to get some video cameras on it, we're finally having a different kind of discussion. This has been going on forever. Young people have been talking about police br brutality, police, police harassment. What we have to understand, and I always say this to some of my government clients, is that therefore that creates a different worldview of government. We may not want to go in and say, we're here from the government, we're here to help you, right? <laughs> they don't have that experience of government that way. So we have to look at those kinds of things. Next thing I always talk about is access. So, you know, in terms of health care, you know, people always say, well, do low-income people have access to health care? Do they actually have access? Back to worldview. Young people have access to health care. It's how they're treated when they get there, which is the issue that they're dealing with. So it's not an access issue. It's a treatment issue. And then finally, education. So, you know, to some of the stats that Tony just showed, I mean, dropout rates, suspensions, all these things are, are, are very serious. They're very serious issues. But when we talk to young people and we query them about education, they identify three types of teachers. They talk about teachers genuinely concerned about them that they know and go to. They can point out the teachers there just for a paycheck, and then they talk about teachers who are afraid of them. How are you going to teach someone if you're afraid of them? So again, worldview. Young people aren't engaged in education, so they don't see any benefit. So we spend a lot of time focusing and understanding worldview, because if you don't understand the worldview, the audience can opt out of your message and say that you're not talking to them. So we do a lot about that. We do a lot of, a lot of work with that. Um, we just came out of research that's actually partially funded by the California Endowment called Moving Beyond Survival Mode, promoting mental wellness and resiliency as a way to cope with urban trauma. And so the same things that you guys have been talking about today, we, I just want to point out the number one, the, number, the, the top five stressors for low-income black people that we uh, talk to around the country. Number one was poverty. I mean, it, meeting ends meet, that, that was it. Making ends meet was number one, bills, getting things. Second was violence, navigating the street. Third was abuse in the home, issues in the home. Fourth was uh, issues around racism. They don't call it racism, but they understand allocations of resource. And then number five was, was harassment. So, you know, just no need to use the words trauma informed for them, just use the actual things that are happening as a way to engage the audience, but to understand stress and trauma is, is still very important. Here's the, here's the thing that came out the most for us in terms of this research, though, was the notion of trust. And what we're really seeing is that these young people really don't trust anyone. And I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that trust may be a mental health issue that we're not dealing with in and of itself because it isolates you and ultimately gets you to uh, have, I think, different types of anxieties and different types, different types of depression. So I think we have to look at trust and we have to understand what trust means to young people. Um, we saw the whole, the whole thing of self-medicating and, and I just want to break these these down in really to two main categories. The first category really was more external ways that that young people are coping negatively, so you see them self-medicating. You can add to this overeating and comfort foods, right? You see violence, getting violence, the whole notion of, of uh, flipping out and tripping out. But then the next two, if, if we're not seeing young people externally cope, we're also seeing them internally cope. And I'm convinced that this is the fuel for chronic disease, particularly in the black community, is that young people are internalizing, they're shutting down, they're not catastrophizing. All of these things are what I think are creating this internal stress because there are a lot of young people who are dealing with it differently, even though we only hear in many ways about the violence or the self-medicating. So we have to understand different ways that young people cope. 
And then how does it show up for us? So I'm convinced that it's not us, it's, it's what's happening to young people. So overwhelmingly, we see it play out in this kind of, these kinds of ways. We see it manifest in these kinds of ways. So this is how it shows up. And again, you've heard about this and we've talked a lot about this. The good news, though, is we see a lot of positive coping in the lowest income communities around the country. And so we've, we documented these four major ways that young people are coping. So we see a lot of talking to friends and family. And so this whole notion of old heads in the community has to be explored more. Young people talked about people they knew in their community who've been there, done that, that they feel comfortable talking to about this kind of stuff. So folks that they can vent with. We see the whole notion of, 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 of folks who do anything that's related to creativity or creative outlets as a positive way for young people to cope with a lot of this stuff. I think even Tony mentioned some of that in his conversation. I've heard it throughout the day. But just having a release, so the connecting with having some kind of release and then the whole notion of also, you know, I, I always discuss this with, with some of my mentors, the whole notion of, of accepting it. Uh, and some people deal with it that way. But there's a whole notion of, of, of how young people cope, which we don't acknowledge enough or we, we, we don't promote enough. So there's a lot of ways that young people told us that they cope just on their own when they're in these kinds of situations. But as I mentioned earlier, there's also ways that young people are thriving, and we have to talk about that as well. I'll get to that in a minute. So the next thing I want to talk about, we've talked about context, we've talked about stress and trauma, and then the next thing I want to talk about is, is the oral versus literate-based culture. So I've been doing this work for 25 years, and the biggest thing that I see is that many of our interventions aren't understanding the oral communication culture of the audience that we're dealing with. And so if you're working in low-income black and Latino communities, primarily you're dealing with an oral-based culture. And I want you to understand that it's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, it's just who they are. And it's really how stories are passed down, how history is passed down, how you can tell the, the communications culture of an audience. But in terms of our public health interventions, it actually means something that we need to understand. And the first thing we need to understand and the first rule of oral tradition is that the receiver of the message has the right to challenge the sender. Let me let you guys take that in a little bit, because that means they're going to challenge us in our interventions. They have the right. This, isn't, this, is, this is a social context where communication is done in a social setting where the receiver views himself as a peer to the sender. All right? So you need to understand that. So the first rule in the oral tradition is the receiver has the right to challenge the sender. Now, I do workshops all around the country, particularly in school districts, where teachers are coming in and they're not used to young people challenging them in the, in the classroom. And they say, well, I sent them to the principal's office a few times and over time they acted right. And I said, no, you lost them because you're not even worthy of discussion anymore. So we need to understand that in the oral tradition, the receiver is going to challenge the, t the teacher to say, are you the expert? Do you have the information that I need and are you open to being challenged? Right? That's what happens in the oral tradition. And then in public health, the community tells you the second rule of oral tradition, which is they have arguments. So young people can tell you the exact reasons why they're not doing the behaviors you want them to do. Whether it's smoking drugs, not using condoms, not going, they'll tell you, here are the arguments. And what I find overwhelmingly in our public health work is we don't know the arguments. And then the third rule of the oral tradition is do you have a persuasive counter argument? And that's what we don't have as well. How are we going to give the community the information they need to make informed choices? So one, you've got to be open to being challenged. Two, they're going to challenge you with an argument. Do you know those? And then three, do you have a persuasive counter argument to those arguments? So this is, because, this is important. Why is this important to public health? Three main reasons, real quick. If you don't do this, they're going to opt out of your message. You're not talking to my reality. You're not talking to my issues. Second thing, you're not going to give them any information to internalize. The whole notion of argument, counter-argument is, is, is analogous to cost benefits in De Clementi's model, right? So the whole notion, you've got to give me the benefits of changing my behavior. And then third is once they leave you, where does, the, where, do, where does that young person or that parent or whoever goes? They go right back into their community. And the exact same arguments you just got are the exact same arguments they're going to get in the community. And if you haven't given them a persuasive counter-argument, what? They have nothing to share. So we have to understand what's happening when we're doing these interventions. And it's great that we have the science, it's great that we have the peer reviews, it's great that we have all this stuff, 
But the community does not care about that. It's how you're going to approach them to build trust to do these interventions. So understand that. Next thing we know is how to reach the audience. I can tell you all types of ways to reach low-income audiences. But what I want you to take away is that there's not just media and there's not just social media. Technology without humanology will not work. And, 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 and as soon as we get away from developing another app or thinking we can throw something over the transom through media or put up a Facebook page and something's going to happen, the sooner we're going to get to failure. Not that you shouldn't do those things, not that we don't do those things, but it needs much more. You need peer, you need peer educators to go out to help you do the work, and you need, to, which is the point I would talk about now, you need to do effective community outreach and mobilization to really be able to get the message out. And I'm an ad agency, and I work with clients all the time, and I get to choose what I, what I want to use. I could do TV and transit and all those kinds of things, and I always say, no, we've got to do community mobilization because it's the best way to put the information into the community. So let me talk real quick in my last few minutes about community as a channel. And people always say, well, Ivan, why do you say community as a channel? And the reason why I say community as a channel is because it competes with media. It actually competes with media, but it's more culturally relevant, and it actually costs less. So if I could compete with media, be more culturally relevant, and then cost less, why wouldn't I do that? So let me talk a little bit about the kind of community engagement work that we do. Why community engagement? Here's the traditional reason. This is what people always say, well, you want, you want collaboration. Yeah, of course we want collaboration. We want, the, we want it reinforced by the community. Of course you want the message reinforced by the community, right? But if you really think about it, the last point, this is how you start really building trauma-informed approaches because the community itself already understands trauma. And so you're actually mobilizing the community to actually support the, the coping, the healing, and the thriving process. And then if you do it right, all you need to bring to the table is reciprocity. You've got to bring reciprocity. I'll talk a little about that. And then the long-term gains are the fact that it, it's, there's, there's long-term benefits because it stays in the community. So as an ad agency, what we see is access and reach. We talk a lot about access, reach. We talk about competing with media. And the key thing we talk about overall is that if you do it right, you get the one at the bottom, which is real true referrals to programs and services because you've mobilized the community to actually take ownership of whatever the initiative is. But you can't just walk in the community and think that this just happens. We call it the keys to the community. And people say, well, how do you really do community engagement? And I always say it's, it's, it's the basic steps that you all go through to build a trusting and working relationship with, with a friend. So if you think about all of these steps, this is what we do. You have to build credibility, which is understanding, which is understanding someone's worldview. It's not just your view, worldview. It's trust, which starts by listening first being consistent and long-term, and then if you do those two correctly, you get access. Now, if you really want to have a strong relationship, which is what we're shooting for in the middle, you've got to be inclusive. There's too many interventions that only have our own agenda at mind. We've got, we can have our agenda, but it has to be inclusive of what their agenda is well, because they know the needs of the community also. So be inclusive. And then Finally, you've got to have a spirit of reciprocity. And people always say, well, Ivan, I don't have any budget for reciprocity. <laughs> so the notion, let me just get this out the way. In low-income communities, reciprocity isn't an amount of money you have. It's the act of giving back and sharing whatever you have. All right? So you have to understand the spirit of reciprocity. And by doing that, that closes the loop. And that gets you a real trusting relationship with the community. And then if you do that effectively, you're in the middle, but you have, you're working with community-based organizations who are working with their constituents, and you get the multiplier effect. And I mean, I'm talking about reaching thousands of people, and the community's doing it for you if you do good community mobilization. This is what you're trying to do. And if you're doing it right, the way we've been talking about the kind of skills, particularly resiliency skills, then those skills stay there forever. We're doing this in Montefiore, we're doing this in the Bronx, we're doing this in Ohio, we're doing it in a number of places where we're, we're trying to really teach hospital systems and agencies how to do community mobilization. But the last point I want to get back, which is the point I didn't make earlier, is why do you do community, community, community mobilization? And the final reason why is if you talk to the top experts 
on thriving strategies in communities. And what do they say? What happens in communities that thrive? They have social fabric. They have village. They have relationships. They have connectedness to others and adults. So by doing this mobilization, it's not just about the benefits of what you're going to be putting in the community. It's about you're really doing thriving, right? You're, you're mobilizing caring adults, role models, and others to be there. So there's some real benefits to doing community mobilization. So then people say, okay, well, what do we do when we get there? What do we say? The thing I'll say is our, our most recent research looks at the fact that the lowest income kids have told us that the number one person they believe in now, and this is a shift over the last five years, is young people tell us they believe in themselves now more than anyone or any other thing. They're forced to believe in themselves. They don't believe in their parents more. They don't believe in the system more. They don't believe in, they have to believe in themselves. So you got to give them aspirational messages. The second thing we have to do is give them coping messages about how to take care of themselves. Now, we also have to give them messages around how to take care of others because my only concern about teaching young people only to take care of themselves who have already been victimized and, and, and taught to be victims is that they don't realize that part of, part of resiliency, part of wellness is also taking care of others. So we have to teach that part as well. And then thriving. And I know we've talked a lot about thriving resiliency. We, we had a conversation earlier this morning, the one thing we don't teach young people thriving-wise, and there's a, there's a number of thriving strategies. There's higher purpose, connectedness to adults. There's a lot of thriving strategies, but one we miss, particularly for boys, is having a plan. If you look at the research and you find that young people who are thriving, girls more than, way more than boys have plans. Boys are rudderless. I got an 11-year-old. They're just connected to their, they're just connected to their iPads or their phones. They're just rudderless. They don't have plans. But giving young people plan, a plan helps them deal with stress and trauma. How? Because if you have a plan, and when stress and trauma happens to you, it's not going to take you off your plan. If you don't have a plan, you think the universe is talking to you and you take it much more personal and you end up take it, you end up internalizing it more. So just giving young people a focus, a plan, those kinds of things. And then finally, the last thing I think we have to teach young people is that they have to demand quality treatment and programs and services and that they need to know their rights about that kind of stuff. That's it. Thank you very much.